Welcome to the Pivot Point Podcast. This season, I'm focused on sharing stories and ideas from experts on diversity and inclusion. In this episode, I will share some insights and ideas from my friend and guest, Lisa Marie Plasky, and we will leave you with some actionable tips to think about and discuss with your organization. We share this information because inclusive leadership is a journey. It requires bravery and courage, and you don't have to do it alone. At Pivot Point, I believe we are stronger together. We are one. So let's introduce this week's guest. Um, I have with me uh, Lisa Marie, and she has 15 plus years of experience in leadership training and coaching and is really an expert on connection and talks about that in the workplace. Uh, Before starting her own business, Upside Thinking, she left her career in federal law enforcement. So I'm sure we've got some juicy stories from that experience. And now is on the Forbes Coaches Council as well as the Evolutionary Business Council. She has many, many books. She is a busy author, has seven books, in fact, and the latest work is about connection, the new currency. She also has previous works on turning possibilities into realities, as well as designing your destiny. So we'll be sure to link to all that in the show notes. But without further ado, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Julie. Excited to be here. Well, we always like to start with your story, your backstory. How did you get into this line of work? What, What about this work lights you up? Ooh, leadership. Leadership for me is, is, has been the thing that I've always been curious about. Like, why do people advance? Why do people become the leader and end up with people who want to follow their vision? How, how does that happen? And so that's what led me to opening the doors of Upside Thinking Incorporated um, 15 years ago. And uh, the background that I had was in federal law enforcement. And in there, there was a, a long, windy road of, of leadership where there was a piece where I was definitely not accepted or seen as a leader. And uh, that led me to being able to use some of this, this, the same principles that allowed me to advance quickly in the government to opening my business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You have some great tidbits stories on your website. Um, and the Navy peer <laughs> story really sticks out, um, from your federal law experience. What was that like? I mean, I know people like to say, oh, that was a long time ago, but you know, we have a lot of data to show that the, the world hasn't changed that quickly. Like these experiences are still alive and well in the workplace. You know, Me Too is not that happened a couple of years ago. So I'm wondering, what was that like for you, Lisa Marie? And how does that help like shape your lens on the work you do now? Ooh, that, oh, so that, that you, you are, um, <laughs> you're so astute. <laughs> so it, it, it is, and it's not that it's that long ago. It almost feels like yesterday because so many of those experiences are experiences that I carry into my work that I do now. I, I, I was, I first took my, uh, in, in, this was in the um, mid 1990s, there was not a women's bathroom on the piers wow. that I worked in. So think about that. Like there wasn't a bathroom for women to use. This is 1990s. <laughs> this is not, you know, we're not talking um, you know, a hundred years ago. So, you know, that experience going places and being the, uh, the, the senior leader that was in charge of an operation and yet being the only female and how that was perceived by the guys. Um, mm-hmm. Post 9-11, when there was an incident and I was called out because I was the supervisor on duty and one of my male counterparts didn't show up. And so, you know, they were radioing for help and I, you know, showed up and it was really fascinating just the dynamic there when you, um, when you look at it from a diversity lens, just how um, crisis can bring people together mm-hmm. and, um, and change and really uh, change the perspective of how, how someone sees something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so many stories that, that I have of, of physically, um, walking into, um, the perceived line of fire 
as a as a woman and as someone who is working in a very male dominated field that colors and shapes um, why it's important for me today to bring different people to uh, to the table in my own conversations in my business yeah yeah knowing what it felt like to not be as seen as heard and, and certainly not a sense of belonging if you don't even have a bathroom to go to yeah, yeah. So it's it's these you know often fast forward to today you know people might say oh things have gotten better right um, but there's still these small little subtle signals that you don't belong and whether that's you're the only one in the room that looks like you or has the same background as you um, or you know, you just, you don't get invited to things that the majority group does. You know, they're, they're called microaggressions. And I hear the stories every day of these subtle, um, unintentional behaviors that people take to, to exclude people. But, but you're right about something like, it, something like crisis can bring us all together. It, it's interesting. Um, one of my friends went dog sledding. <laughs> this will make sense in a minute. <laughs> She was telling me the story. I'm like, what does this have to do with anything? She goes dog sledding with her husband. And um, as they're getting in the sled, um, she just comments on the dogs. And um, they made a specific comment about the dogs um, that they always have females and males together, half and half leading. Uh, and she said, well, why? She said, oh, we would never put all males just together, all females together. It would be a mess. And I thought to myself, wow, like this, there's something primal about the need for gender balance and to have both of us kind of this yin yang effect that we both bring. You know, I'm sure you saw it when you were co-leading or working with your male counterparts, you bring different perspectives and it's the balance of those perspectives, not the replacement of the male perspective that we're looking for. And if it works for dogs, it probably works for humans. <laughs> yeah. How, how you know, how true. And, and I, I'll share that for as many stories that I have where it was, um, where I was singled out and that feeling of not belonging, I have equally as many stories where someone took a stand for me. Yeah. And one of the stories that is, is really interesting when you speak about that balance is one of the guys on a team that I was working at when I was doing uh, um, it was a it was a, a money laundering investigation team, and I the one of the guys was getting married, and so they were going to do the bachelor party and go out and celebrate and do stuff. And then they look around, and it's like there's me. So how is this going to work for them? Like what are they going to do? Because they didn't want to not include me. I was a huge part of the team and they appreciated my perspective, which was often very different. Or I would see and notice little things that perhaps they didn't, you know, they just never paid attention to. So they created this space where there was, it was a three part bachelor party. And like the first part was a sit down dinner. Um, and then the second one was going to this, um, truly seedy bar that was really kind of funny. Um, and, and, um, and then the third one, they made the decision that they were going to go to a strip club. And so at the end of the second, the second act, if you will, you know, they said, okay, so it's time for you to go home now. And, um, you know, really honoring, like you don't want to go there. And one of the guys offered to drive me home and they put me in a car and made sure that I got home safely. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about that, there are, um, and part of that came because I was the federal woman's program manager. And I used to put on these programs that talked about women in the workplace and really about inclusivity and belonging and what that was like. Yeah. And at first the guys on my team went kind of kicking and screaming like, Oh, no, good grief. But out of a way to honor me, they showed up for the programs. So it used to be all women. And then this one row of guys that was the guys on my team. <laughs> um, and so what I noticed was how they behaved differently at, the, at work than some of the other guys I worked with. Mm -hmm. of their awareness increasing. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's where you have to start. The journey starts with awareness and education and just being in the room and listening. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what you're, you're seeing what I'd call allies. Um, and it is like a domino effect. That's why we need men involved in the conversation, whether it's gender equality or 
you know, racial issues, whatever it is, you know, we have um, an opportunity to educate the majority group um, that if, if they, only they could see how we could all benefit from this. And when yeah. we all feel connection and belonging, the workplace is better for everybody and we grow much faster too. So <laughs> there's a business case and a human case for this. Um, yeah, I'm so curious, Lisa Marie, like tying to your work that you do now on, you know, connection and, and, and we know that connection and belonging, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs translates very much to today's workplace of wanting to feel like you belong, that you, people want you there, that you were seen, heard. Um, and we know that people that are underrepresented inside organizations, usually by, you know, it could be skin color, it could be their ethnicity, their culture, their gender, their um, sexual orientation, their abilities, whatever it may be, we just know that that's less likely to happen. Um, and so I'm curious for you, like what tools, what, what, what things do you see for inclusive leaders building connection on their teams? What would you offer to our, our listeners that want to learn more? Tools for, for building connection. I, I first look at it as the willingness to dive into different personalities. And you and I have had this conversation, the willingness to look at behaviors that each person brings as an individual and, and coming from the lens of welcoming opinions that are different and what that means. And so a lot of, many organizations will use assessments in the organization as a way for um, an, an individual to see how they're operating. Taking it to the next level, some of the best organizations that I've seen have taken it where they've given classes and educated their employees on not putting other people in boxes, but looking for the commonalities, looking for the similarities, looking for the, the ways in which the behavior shows up as this, this beautiful thread in people who may look very different, sound very different, um, and perhaps even in some ways they may think that they, they think very different, and yet how they operate, their operating system is very much the same. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, uh, um, I'm sure you've gone into organizations where you've seen assessments like 360s and DISC assessment and Myers-Briggs, and they're often used as an individual development versus a team or cross-cultural development. Mm -hmm. And so the best organizations that I've gone into, like I say, take it one step further and look at it as the lens of how do I actually communicate better? How do I, how do I listen for who it is that I'm speaking the, the, who it is that I'm speaking with, who I'm speaking um, about a particular topic, what am I hearing, so mm -hmm. that you can actually speak to their listener. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so important that we see diversity from all lenses, right? And, and I think personality is a great example of we all have um, a different personality style, you know, whether you've been assessed or not. <laughs> There's lots of tools out there to know more. Um, but it's really recognizing those differences and seeing them as a positive thing and then really listening and being curious to hear that perspective. Because a lot of times, you know, if, if I offer, you know, people are always like, well, what's one thing I can do to be better at this to create a more inclusive culture? You know, I, I think it's looking around meeting room behavior is so telling. And I think that what you're describing here is making sure that all voices are heard, <laughs> that all perspectives are heard, that all people are invited to the table. Um, and I often say, just ask in the next meeting, what perspective are we missing here? Um, or if, if you notice certain people are not participating in discussions as much as others, and maybe it's being um, mostly, um, most of the discussion is from the majority group, which tends to happen. How can you bring others into the conversation? How can you make sure others feel seen, heard, and belong as an ally? Um, because we can all kind of encourage other people. And it's these small, it really is the small everyday behaviors that matter most to people. I'm yeah. Curious. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please, no, please go. No, you just, you brought up that when you tie it into connection and you ask that question, 
the one of the tools I invite people to use is that of who's your champion. Understand who's your champion mm -hmm. in the room. Yep. And if you're not sure, then you find one yourself and find an advocate. And so there are, there are um, I can even think of a situation myself where I was in a, a, um, a board meeting and I had spoken to two people ahead of time and said, so I'm going to bring something up that's going to be somewhat controversial. And I would like for you to just say, hey, that's a great idea. <laughs> and I shared what, what it is. You know, I shared with them what, what the idea was and, and, and they, they thought it was. And I said, I just need you to say that. And, and what I learned is that when two or more people say that, there's more willingness with other people to go, oh, we should listen or okay, let's, but when you're the lone voice and it feels like you're out on an island yourself, that's why the connection is so important because if you connect with people ahead of time, when you yeah. go into these situations, you're not, you're not, you belong. You already belong before you walked in the door. Yep. Yeah. That's so poignant. Um, I love that idea of the champion to float the idea ahead of time. You don't want to surprise your champion. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> people don't like surprises unless it's their birthday. <laughs> so that yes. pre-meeting and I, you know, the meeting before the meeting is important. <laughs> but just, you know, I, I call it, you know, sponsors a lot of times, the influencers inside mm -hmm. organizations, you know, the people that they're, if they say yes, it's going to go. If you get their support, then it means a lot more than just anybody's support. Knowing who those people are and having their ear about what you want, what your ideas are, what kind of projects you want, where do you want to go in your career? It's so important. And, and what we know to be true is the majority group. And when I say majority group, I mostly mean, mean male, white, you know, straight, cisgender, however you want to describe it. We just know that more times than not, those the majority group has more sponsors because sponsors are more likely to be of the majority group. And we like people like us. So for women, for people of color, with people with disabilities, whatever it is, we know that they're just not getting access to those people. So I love your idea because that is something you can own, right? I, I think there's always this balance between woe is me and victimhood, which um, I know neither one of us advocate for, but I think there is this sense of it isn't fair. However, what can I do to make it a little more fair? Um, and then mm -hmm. people can meet you where you're at. So if you take the first step and you show a willingness to find an advocate, if you don't have one, then that, that sets in motion some positive momentum that can carry forward. And, and like you said, the other people take note and then it starts to model behavior and build an inclusive culture just by those small everyday actions. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, it's, it's just critical. Yeah, I know. And at least Marie, I know you, you, you have a treasure trove of stories and, and, um, you know, things that you've experienced in your 15 years in your business and before. Um, and I'm so thankful for the story you shared about the, the bachelor party. It's, it, these are real things that happen. I mean, <laughs> I worked at Caterpillar, that was my first job out of college, and there was a world-renowned strip club in downtown Peoria that I can't tell you how many times I went there with my male colleagues. <laughs> I didn't even think anything of it. Um, and that was the early 2000s. It wasn't that long ago. So I appreciate you know, making this, the context real and showing what good looks like on the other side of this. It sounds like it was a good group of guys you're working with. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, fast forward to, you know, we're in 2020. I'm calling 2020 the year of the ally and where we really start to see inclusion thrive. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. What would you offer as far as stories our listeners can learn from of leaders getting this right? Like where do you see people having success with connection and inclusion in the workplace? Well, you know, one of the stories that comes up for, for me is, um, is a, a client of mine who. Uh, had a campaign that she created and uh, was a, a DNI manager director in a in a, a very large public utility, and the the organization as a whole was not a hundred percent behind this. So like it's no, it's not going to work. And what it was is it was a campaign where they reached out to people to tell their stories, a personal story um, about something that was uh, going on with them and they create, they had a photo of the person and this brief story and they had it in the front of the business 
um, all of these, you know, faces and these wonderful stories um, of the employees and their, um, I guess, what they enjoyed about the organization. But the component about it was that there was deep vulnerability. And the, so much came out of this campaign. There actually was talks, other organizations within the DNI space had come to her and said, hey, you know, I'd love to be able to bring this to my organization. And so what I, what, what comes to mind for me when I look at, you know, what's, what's well is the willingness to take a risk when other people say, hey, that's really crazy. And nobody's going to be willing to be that vulnerable here at work, especially in a really large organization. And I find that that's really not true. And so um, these trends about being in the conversation and the awareness and the curiosity of others goes back to something that you said earlier, which is that human connection, that, that, that greater desire. And so that was one of the things. And then the other thing is I had another um, a specific organization, Catholic Children's Aid Society of Toronto, um, where a client of mine had, had, done some work and she really her her mantra is that inclusion is an outcome and what they what they did um in looking at uh gender equality and looking at um race in looking at every every through every lens the willingness to to look at every lens really detailed and measure um, was to me just highly impressive because when you're when you make the decision to look at what your organization looks like and who you serve, um, sometimes it's messy. And so for for me, this was like wow, you know, the willingness to 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 really get in the weeds and say what are what are we not doing well, mm -hmm. um, and. Who, who are we really as an organization? What do we stand for? That's, that's, that's hard stuff. Not everybody has a, um, has a willingness to, to be able to do that. And, and the third, you know, th this is just a, a, the third snippet with an organization is there's a, an organization called Path North that's here in Virginia. And I was invited to come to the table to talk about racial civility. Oh. And I thought this was an interesting, really interesting for me to, to come to the table um, as a, as a white female and, and be someone who was invited into this conversation. And it's because they want to do a, a civil, a, a series on, on racial civility. And I sit on the, the board of a global nonprofit project forgive. And so a lot of my work, even in going into corporate, I'll do some forgiveness work to, to forward different initiatives. And, um, and so this conversation that I just was so appreciative that this organization is willing to bring sides together that, and, and to be able to speak about some of the real hurts that have gone on um, and speak about it from, from a place of healing and not a place of anger. And yet at the same time, understanding that, you know, tensions were high in some of, you know, in, some of the conversation, um, you know, just, just, just give such kudos to them for the willingness to, to, to look. And so I find that there's more and more of that out there of being in the conversation, uh, even in project forgive, you know, we, we at our board, we, we have the conversation, uh, regularly because we'll be doing something in a school district for probation officers or, or schools for kids. And there'll be someone on the board that'll say, you know, in my community, that, would not fly, you know, because our mm. board is very diverse. And then it's like, oh, we've got to peel this back and say, ah, that's interesting. Never, never would have thought about that. Mm. Um, one of our board members is from Laos and she was sp specifically speaking about the Asian community and, you know, just what we were looking to propose with, with having conversations with parents and said like that would never fly because, because you'd never get them to open up in the way that we had envisioned it. Um, and so, so many good good organizations out there that are willing to look at their practices right now. I mean, I'm just, I'm yeah. over the moon excited about it.
It is. And I think it's really nice to open up from a place of I'm a white person, right? And owning that privilege, owning the obvious. Because I am in rooms, you know, where I do talk about intersectionality and I'm not an expert on race, but I really want to be an ally. I strive to be an ally, a white ally. I have learned so much um, in the last few years as I've gotten more interested and um, curious about this topic and read about it and listen to podcasts and watch Netflix specials about it. Again, not an expert, but I have just gotten better as a human from being curious about these issues. <laughs> you know, it's made me better. Yeah. I really think that yeah. and I get so, um, it, it's helped me understand too what it means to be an ally. You know, I was asking men to be allies for women. Well, how was I being an ally? It was, and I've learned so much being on the other side of it is there is a fear of saying and doing the wrong thing. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I have an African-American ally that I ask her, you know, is it okay to say black or do you prefer African-American? And we can have that candid conversation. And she, she'll tell me, you know, I don't really care, Julie, but some people do. So you, you do need to ask. Thank you. That is so helpful. <laughs> you know, yeah. everyday things that, Um, I find when I share that story and we had her um, on the podcast um, a few weeks ago, you know, when I share that story of Erica, it really disarms people like, okay, she's not pretending to know what it's like. (laughs) Like she, she's curious too. And she's helping model what, what it means to be an ally. I'm trying to show people like, this is tough stuff. This is why I have to talk about it because people don't know how to do it naturally. Yeah. That, that permission is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, permission to uh, be in for ourselves to be in the conversation um permission with other people to understand from their lens what they're experiencing yeah. i just um it's 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 a dance it really is a dance and there's times julie will i i will say i i i get it right and it's mm-hmm. so good and there's times when i don't get it so right and um and i'm <laughs> <Me> grateful, <too. laughs> just really grateful for the people who um like you said, are, are the, uh, those that are, are our allies in helping us be better humans. Cause yeah. that's, that's really what it does for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that as a, as a final takeaway, asking for permission, because it's not fair for underrepresented people to have to educate the majority group on what it's like to be underrepresented. You know, I can mm-hmm. tell you I was in a classroom recently where that issue was floated by a woman of color. She's like, I'm exhausted. Like not only did someone insult me, but now I have to be nice about telling them they insulted me. <laughs> like I get it. And that burden shouldn't fall on you, but I don't know what else to do because we know education and awareness is needed and people aren't going to change behavior unless they know. Um, so how do you, how do you help them not do that again? Uh, and it, it's, it's hairy. I mean, this stuff is messy. Um, it has a lot of compassion mm-hmm. fatigue. I know you and I traded notes on that <laughs> uh, before the podcast. Yeah. It, it takes a lot out of us to, to be brave and to be vulnerable a, a lot. It's a lot of energy. Um, so we got to make sure we're practicing self-care too. Uh, well, Lisa Marie, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Let our listeners know how can they connect with you, follow you, continue the conversation with you. Thank you, Julie. It, it's, this has been a delight. My website is upsidethinking.com. So that's where someone can find a little more about me. And that's U-P-S-I-D-E and the word thinking.com, all, all the word. And, um, and I love to connect with people on LinkedIn. In fact, that's one of the places that you and I have had conversations. Yep. So you can always find me there at Lisa Marie Platsky. Yes. Perfect. So we'll link to all that in the show notes. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being on today. I deeply appreciate you and the work that you're doing in the world. Thank you for all you're doing to make the world a better place. Thank you for sharing your story. Did you know that you can find all five seasons of our 50 plus episodes at nextpivotpoint.com and you can sign up for a complimentary seven day preview of our new program, Lead Like an Ally and order our new book, Lead Like an Ally. I appreciate you listening to this episode. Who do you know that needs to hear this message? Hit the share button and connect with me on LinkedIn. I post every single day. Simply search Julie Kratz, K-R-A-T-Z. I host this podcast because I believe we are stronger together. We are one.